hello everybody thanks for for uh, for signing up today there's there's a number of people on the uh, on the call that that I recognize the names of there's there's plenty of people that I don't know as well so my name is Scott McNeil and uh, yes Simon's done the intro for me which is great so I'll not take too much time at that uh, just thanks for everybody for for signing in I guess because in the era of uh, 101 webinars uh, appreciate there's loads of options and opportunities to to get into stuff so uh, really appreciate that you've, you've chosen to sign into this today. Uh, I guess in my background, as, as Simon has, has sort of alluded to, um, certainly come from, from hockey as my original sport and then uh, you know moved across to England uh, uh, in 2013 or so to work for England Hockey and then subsequently Great Britain Hockey as an opportunity to, uh, to be a consultant really and I've been doing that now for the last five years, uh, working still with Great Britain Hockey, with the Premier League over the last year and a half or so. Some other bits and bobs and pieces on the side, but really, really appreciative and grateful to Sport and I to be a, a coach developer for them as well. And I think it's great what Simon and the gang there have been doing over this period, and I'm sure it will continue. Equally, again, just in terms of context, um, you know, this might just be one small jigsaw piece for you today in stuff that you already know, stuff that's already in your head uh, or stuff that you'll come across in the future. Um, and without making Simon too nervous in his seat, I'm definitely not the expert in this space. Um, I'm, not, I'm not an academic. Um, I'm the same as, as most people. I've come across some content and, and I've tried to apply it. Um, that's been in a system based way, I guess, you know, from working for different governing bodies and things like that. Uh, but there's lots of people who are who are probably on this call actually who are, who are much more who are brighter than me in this topic. So it's just a case of these are some applied experiences uh, related to the theory as well. In terms of some reading that's be useful for that, so anybody that's got the the Amazon Prime app ready to go, um, certainly uh, a friend and colleague, Danny Newcomb, uh, on the right hand side there is somebody that, that I've been following closely for a number of years on this topic and has certainly helped shape my thinking, specifically in a team uh, sport um, environment, uh, but also from an individual sport environment, and I suppose. As context today, I know there'll be a number of individual sports on the call. I'll try my best to pick up a couple of examples, uh, but I suppose my bias and my experience sits in team sport. So fingers crossed that's back on your screen. Uh, so today what we're going to try to do in terms of covering uh, some topics, very, very quickly cover off stuff to do with learning and the three godgies as I have on the screen there. We'll cover off also variability, perception action coupling and nonlinear learning and a nonlinear journey. I'll probably get into the, after a bit of a break, get into principles uh, and then finish off with some of my experiences from, from Great Britain Hockey, maybe specifically, and, and a few others. So to begin with, how does understanding learning and things like pedagogy help us, do we think? Perhaps it could uh, inform and help us to be critical about some of the decisions we make as coaches or coach developers, whatever your role might be when it comes to designing practice and any of the environments we're responsible for. You're in a position where you're trying to enhance the learning of players. Uh, that process is messy. It requires you to make lots and lots of decision, decisions. Understanding learning might help us make some of those decisions. And if we're involved in learning for both players or coaches, uh, can you actually define it? And how do we know that it's taking place? Not only is it about our players uh, talking about something, um, they've got to be able to do it on the pitch or in the performance environment as well. And I can definitely remember teams that if the scores were decided on their ability to complete, you know, like a hockey-based quiz, they would have won the league. Uh, they could answer every question, they could analyse the, the video, they could tell you what was wrong, although sadly they couldn't transfer that talking into doing something uh, about it, you know, on the pitch. And there's a number of definitions for, for learning. Uh, most are suitably vague, uh, but allude to something similar. Most of them talk about something long term and some kind of change in behaviour. And ultimately, that's where you're noticing in your players what, what, how they're evolving. Are they doing stuff differently and consistently? There's some form of learning is probably taking place if they are, but it doesn't always mean that it's positive. It means there's been a change in behaviour. They could learn bad things, of course, uh, and for example, that could be anything to do with, you know, technicalities, tactical stuff, or anything else. 
there's lots to think about in that statement in relation to behaviours, decisions and skill sets, potentially where the expression can't teach an old dog new tricks might come from. And without going off on a complete tangent at the start, really, uh, I think this makes me think more so about, um, you know, the malleable minds of, of young people, um, the, uh, the, the benefits of, of late developers as well, and probably just at that point of when is it too late to change some behaviours, if that's the case. And this sort of reminds me of a story of uh, a hockey player at the London 2012 Olympics who scored a, a backhand shot, as you can do in hockey. It was an ugly looking thing, and, and, uh, but it was really relatively understood between the player and the coach that uh, that, that was probably the, the most consistent uh, way to do it, um, a consistent uh, action uh, that was way more important than having a really attractive version of, of that skill uh, that might have been hit or miss. In this case, ultimately, it ended up being a, a goal and, and, and the rest is history, of course. Um, so. I'm interested in learning and I encourage others to be. I'm curious about the teacher these days as, as much as about the player. What I don't know is what will the future of learning look like, but all I do know is that I think it will look different. Um, and I think we have to embrace that. Now, the irony is not lost on me here today that uh, an attempt to create a learning environment, I'm talking at you the whole, t the whole time. We do hope, as Simon alluded to, to do a breakout session halfway through and, and get you guys talking to each other because uh, that's probably more beneficial. And the big question that will come up again near the end of the presentation will be this. What are you taking away? Some, there might be some interesting stuff here today. There might be some stuff that you've heard lots of before, but what are you taking away and what are you going to do about it? So into a little bit of the theory. Um, the question is, as performers become more skillful, do their movement patterns become more consistent or less consistent? Just let that hang for a second and just be mindful it's about their movement patterns. So actually the more skillful we are, the more consistent you are in achieving a successful outcome. We kind of know that, that makes sense. Uh, so the more skillful players will have a better passing accuracy, for example, they're, they're more consistent, they'll hit the target. Uh, so we know that the outcome is more consistent. Also, the more skillful you are, the more creative and adaptable you can be, and that all kind of makes sense. So there's a piece of research originally done on blacksmiths, and they found that expert blacksmiths hit the point, hit the exact spot where they were aiming for more often than not. Kind of makes sense. But just like expert, expert golfers uh, are more consistent in the right contact of the ball, they did find that the arc of the hammer for a blacksmith, the movement part was slightly less consistent in the experts than it was in people who were yet to become expert. So it's interesting when you think about it about that, they hit the point, but the process was, was more inconsistent. And similarly, there was a bit of research done in, in long jumpers uh, and elite long jumpers are more consistent about where they put their foot close to the line. Again, probably makes a bit of sense when you think about it. They don't go over as often and they don't come short as often. Uh, you might expect they have to do a set number of steps, which they do. However, here's the thing to watch out on is that the variability in those steps was significantly higher in expert athletes than it was in the more intermediate athletes. So what, um, what does that mean for us coaching a kid how to kick a football or, or anything else that we do? I would just like to sort of put it out there. It's probably less about the technical model uh, and it's more about consistent outcomes. Golf's a really easy one uh, to look at sometimes and a couple of probably famous golfers and Jim Furyk who has this really elaborate swing which doesn't look like a textbook uh, and Bubba Watson on the right there who can do lots of creative things. Now of course most expert golfers can do lots of creative things but it just shows you that there's no one model and I think we've been able to get hung up on that over the years. So to my next point, as variability of outcome goes down, i.e we get more consistent outcome. The variability of movement actually goes up. And it's easy to believe that skilled performers are consistent and that's not technically true. The outcome's consistent, the movements tend to be somewhat variable. Of course, the variability might be really subtle in a lot of inst instances. You know, think of a, a footballer taking a first touch. Um, a good first touch can look like many different things. So if we need to be interested in variable movement solutions, we need to be interested in variable practice. 
and variable variable practice will result in your player develop, developing variable solutions. Uh, conversely, consistent practice or what might be called block practice arguably will less likely develop, develop variable solutions. To help us think about this in another example, what are the strengths uh, because there are strengths uh, and what are the limitations because there also are limitations of employing a bowling machine in cricket. And for any non-cricket fans, a bowling machine is basically a machine that fires out a ball um, and is opposed to you know, somebody running up and, and bowling it themselves. One observation about a bowling machine though is it is designed to be consistent. So we ask coaches to use a bowling machine if you want a consistent ball feed, which makes sense. Uh, but maybe that's not what the game requires all the time. So the research would show that the batsmen actually learn to get better against the bowling machine. Uh, when they've been placed into an environment with bowlers, the batsman hasn't necessarily developed the right relationship with the right cues. I guess when we practice, um, we get better at the thing that we practice at, which makes sense. You are what you repeatedly do. So interestingly, they strap on the goggles onto the batsman and, and they look at where their focus was when the bowler was coming in. Uh, and what do we think the main areas a batsman looks at whenever the bowler is running in? The ball, the hand, the wrist, and probably a bit of the arm. And obviously, and I appreciate quite crudely, what's missing from a bowling machine is a hand, a wrist, and an arm, and, and you can't really see the ball until it's on its way. So the batsmen were developing a relationship with the wrong thing, but it doesn't mean they're not getting better against the bowling machine. And that's the bit that kind of uh, tricks us a little bit because they will get better at, at, uh, at doing certain things. The argument would be obviously is that they're not necessarily attaching a decision to the action. Uh, but I'm, I'm really clear on this before we start sort of phoning up the companies that create uh, and make bowling machines to tell them they should, should wind it up. Um, there's definitely a balance to the argument, of course. As long as we know that there, there isn't the same decision making involved and as long as we're using it with that knowledge and as long as we know the bowling machine is, is missing some important cues, but we're using it anyway. And here's why, you know, confidence, repetition, consistency. And that's where we need to get our, our coaches to, to make those decisions about what's the right tool or what's the right environment, linked back to the professional judgment slide near the start of the presentation. So it's all kind of linked to what learning in sport is. Learning in sport is the development of something that the theory calls perception, action, coupling. Now, for most of us, that's a posh academic chat, really. But uh, basically, I'd be better at picking out the, the, the key information from the environment and attaching the right action to it. So as a player, the more I engage in an environment, the more I develop a relationship with it. The more balls that I are rolled towards me on my weak foot in football or outside my backhand side in, in hockey, the better I am at picking up the speed, the angle, the depth. The better my perception skill becomes is the better I'm, I'm attaching the right action to have a good first touch, for example. And the more we do that, perceive and act, perceive and act, um, the tighter those couplings become. It's interesting just thinking back, as there'll be a few people who will remember my hockey days, but as a, as a very, very young hockey player, uh, many years ago now, I knew that receiving the ball outside my left foot, or what was traditionally called the, the weak side in hockey, was something that I, I needed to improve on. So I did it loads. I asked my dad or my brother or my best friend to keep putting it out there. So much so that in time, I think my first touch out there was better than my first touch on my open side. Again, we are what we repeatedly do. Another silly example uh, is if, if anyone's been to the airport where it has, you know, the, the travel leaders on the ground um, and you've ever walked up towards one that's not working, it's really easy to perceive the belt to, to be actually moving. So when you walk up and it's not, what happens? You take this really weird, awkward first step uh, and that's because you've perceived it to be moving and you've acted accordingly. Uh, it's the same as whenever we haven't played sport for a while. Um, you know, if you've been off for a number of weeks or months, injured or, or whatever else, not only do you come back uh, feeling a little bit unfit, but it feels clunky. It feels like you maybe footwork's off if that's important or, or whatever else. And what's actually happened there is those perception and actions have just sort of dissolved a little bit and we need to build them back up in time. So the discussion about the bowling machine is really quite simple then. We've developed a perception action coupling with the bowling machine, but the problem is it's not the same perception action coupling when it's 
needed in the game and it's a guy bowling it towards you. So our decisions as coaches is to make sure that we develop the right perception action in training that will then be useful in the game. So a quick question to think about. Um, in football, why are mannequins um, better than cones? Probably better because we're perceiving stuff at a height that's not on the ground. So we're actually scanning at a level that's, uh, that's at least equivalent to, to what would be like in the game. So then conversely, what's the problem with mannequins compared to people? They don't move. So we're not picking up moving targets. Does that mean that we never use mannequins in football? No, we do. Uh, but we have to understand that obviously they don't move and therefore they are limited. Uh, they are useful at a certain point for, for certain things, of course. So again, why might I use a bowling machine when I don't have somebody that can bowl at 90 miles per hour? consistently is it better to experience a ball flying at me as a batsman at 90 miles per hour probably yes so i make a judgment on how much of that experience is useful understanding it's not fully useful to go and perform when it's some guy trying to do things differently every time so a definition of highly skilled players experts encounter an environment overflowing with opportunities they single out uh, those opportunities that are most relevant and uh, preference and needs in that specific situation. So there's a huge dynamic environment going around them. Experts can pick out the important things from that environment, filter out the noise. That's the perception bit. Those who are good at this probably make quite good decisions. Uh, the bottom bit now on the screen is that the relevant distinction is better marked by differences in the level of ability of expertise in doing things with these opportunities. And that's the action. So for me, I'm playing left back. Um, I can see the 75 meter diagonal pass on my, on my weak left foot. I can perceive that's a good thing to happen right now because the picture sort of says that's a good opportunity. The problem is I can't execute it. For the top performers, it's the decision and the action attached together. They can do both. So the game-based approach that, that often gets talked about, um, I don't think it's 100% a game-based approach, but any good game-based approach is not hands-off uh, coaching. Careful consideration, manipulation, facilitation, and questioning is needed. I actually think it's harder uh, to do a game-based uh, coaching approach. Um, it's dynamic, it's difficult. You have to ask the right question at the right time. Um, in a highly variable, uh, a variable environment is hard to get it right and something good, good coaches genuinely struggle with. So block practice can be quite attractive at times. Um, you know, why would that be? Because it's easy to control, it's easy to manage, um, it's easy to be attracted to that because it provides structure for us, structure for them. It can look clean and tidy and parents on the sideline think, oh, that looks like a pretty good session. But is it a providing the right challenge to our environments. Um, that's, that's the debate, I think. So firing a rocket into space or bringing up a child, both difficult tasks, which task could be described as more linear? And I've probably helped you answer that by where I've put the words on the screen. The spaceship or the rocket going into space. Still not easy, of course, physics, maths, uh, you're still firing an object into an unpredictable environment, which means things could go wrong. Ultimately, there's more objective things we can work out though with the, with the spaceship. Um, there's things we can measure, there's things that we can control. And as, humans, as human beings, we tend to like that. And the wee one on the right, uh, this, is, this is my nephew, Charlie. Uh, my brother would tell me that uh, he can walk into the room one day, Charlie's going to be crying. He tries something uh, and it works. He can walk into the room the next day, Charlie's crying again. He can try the exact same thing and it doesn't always work. So essentially human beings are, are complex systems. They're unpredictable. They are by definition non-linear. And because of that, this coaching job that we do is, is pretty difficult. People are unpredictable. Uh, I'm sure that you've been there where you've done a practice one week with the group and it's gone really well. You thought, right, okay, bank that. I'll come back next week and do that again. And you come back next week and you do it again and it doesn't work so well. Completely different outcomes. Uh, they engage with it completely differently. 
So understanding that we deal with little versions of Charlie is really important um, and it's a philosophical thing. If we coach the spaceship, um, our job would look very different to coaching Charlie. So I would almost say embrace the chaos, embrace the non-linearity, the unpredictability and understand and be comfortable with that coaching is definitely not easy. Creating appropriate instability is a really important thing as a coach. Uh, you could use the word challenge. Um, anyone who's loved computer games over the years, you know, be that Pac-Man through to Fortnite or whatever's trendy at the minute. Um, what we do at level one is, is basically learn solutions that give us access to level two. And when the instability increases, we learn and, and come up with solutions against that instability. And then we get access to level three and so on and so forth. If we dropped you into level 50, what would that be like? Probably too hard. And if we left you at level one repeatedly, what would the problem be? Probably get bored. Um, so to be clear, training isn't always about providing massive instability, but training sometimes is just about, you know, feeling competent and feeling, feeling confident with something. Again, that's professional judgment you need to make, as we said at the start, but if you want people to learn, the key is you must provide some form of instability, call it what you like. So I was watching a hockey coach uh, not that long ago, and he's doing a really interesting practice, uh, and the players are mucking it up. Um, they're making errors, they're struggling, and the coach was like visibly, you know, getting really annoyed uh, and frustrated at the sideline. And he, was, he began to bark at them a little bit, so I decided to just check in. I just asked if you're okay and he said yeah oh, you just you know he's really vexed you know he, he's just saying they just don't get it um and he said well what you know i said well what, what, what are you going to do about it he said oh i just don't know they just don't get it. i'm really frustrated they got it last week now we're doing the same thing again and they just don't get it and i said well you've probably got it about right haven't you and he said well what do you mean and i said well you've you've put out a problem there's a little bit of chaos uh, and they're having to organize against it um, and listen if time takes on obviously sort of step in and try to make changes and affect the environment but allow a little bit of the struggle and again this sort of just reminds me that the key thing is that humans are non-linear we're evolved to find solutions to instability uh, that's how we're still alive probably now here's the watch out of course uh, it doesn't mean um, that I can throw my little nephew Charlie into the deep end of the pool um you know because i can't just turn around to my brother and say you know just give it 10 minutes let him work it out problem will be he could probably drown but also i also don't want to stick him into the shallow end either um thinking why not well probably because he'd find it he'd work out the challenge he'd probably put his foot on the floor and stand up and not actually learn how to swim so this is a really good analogy um that we need to put our players and our participants out of their depth a little bit, uh, but we also need to provide them with the right support. It's at then that we coach. So it's really important to create the right environment first, let them find solutions or not, uh, and then we coach. And trying to sort of envisage learning and skill development in a non-linear journey, the analogy I'd give you is to put a uh, hundred yellow ducks at the top of the river and set them off. Would they all arrive at the same point at the same time? No. Would they all take the exact same route? No. And would they all make it one way or another? Maybe not. So if you can imagine a group of players along their direction of travel, the way you help them is the environments you put around them, uh, the support that you give them and the challenge that you also provide. Ultimately, uh, supporting their learning is a nonlinear journey. And just begin before we take a quick break, just priming Simon for that, um, that whenever you see this on a, on a sporting uh, slide deck, what does it make you think? People talk about 10,000 hours um, and uh, that's been challenged, I think, in, in recent time. And I think I was actually misquoted uh, at the very, very start whenever it came out. Interestingly, there's a guy, uh, Man United, their academy director, a guy called Nick Cox, um, and he is a big fan of, of 10,000 experiences. So it's not just the repetition of stuff. It's actually providing a shared load of different experiences. And I guess that's our job. So what I'm going to do there, Simon, is I'm going to press pause, if that's okay. I'm going to come out, let you take over in terms of breakout rooms. 
numbers are back up. But okay, guys, we'll crack on. Thanks so much for uh, in, engaging with that. Um, interestingly, I think what Simon and I had probably hoped for that was that if you have any questions that you heard there or that you had yourself, that potentially you could drop them into the uh, to the chat box. Um, uh, you can click chat at the bottom of the screen and, and, and type that in there at, at any point. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Uh, and again, useful to just not have to listen for an hour and a half solid as well, just to help break it up a little bit. I've got a quick uh, video just to show, fingers crossed it comes across okay. Um, uh, it's only about 30 seconds or so before we start the next session. A quick example of how uh, a learning environment can directly correlate to, to our performance environments uh, and I guess really the just the second half of this um, just to go a little bit further with some of the things that we mentioned but to recognize that, that indeed we are the the architects of, of these learning environments um, there are four principles that uh, we sort of talk talk about that are based on a little bit of theory uh, and by the end of the session I'll, I'll probably try to relate to certainly how that's tried to come across in a hockey context um, so the first one then is intention um, this probably sounds like the most obvious thing in the world to a lot of people, but a lot of coaches plan an intention, uh, an environment or a training session, and they don't really always have a clear intention. That doesn't mean that the intention can't change. Um, but the first question I would always ask a coach before any session starts is, what do you want to get out of today? What is your intention? It would be interesting to know the, the link between um, the players needs and wants as well which is a maybe a different conversation but the intention should drive all the decisions the, the coach then makes what practice to use how much feedback how am I going to be uh, it drives everything so for example if you lose 9-1 on, on Saturday in a, in a football match my intention um, might be just I want them to be happy playing football again. Um, I want them to feel better about themselves and, and hopefully come back next week. So therefore, what would my session look like with that context? What would it feel like? What practices would I use? Will it be overly unstable? Probably not. Um, I can see how my uh, intention will shape everything. If my sessions are about exploring something new and doing new stuff, will I get loads of goals? Yes. Um, will there be heavy consequences for those goals? Probably not. And what sort of things will the coach be saying? Things like nice try and, and well done. But if my session is about executing under pressure, then it will start to look and feel pretty different. Number of goals, probably less. Consequences, probably higher. It'd be really interesting to ask your coaches, what is your intention today? Clearly, tell me explicitly what you're working on. What will the players tell me they've got out of the session whenever it finishes? What coaches often tell me is doing a bit of passing stuff, a bit of small unit stuff, um, you know, a bit of gameplay at the end. And I would sort of just say that's not really specific enough. That's not an intention for me. Um, so it could be technical or tactical, emotional, um, and it could be anything in between. Energy flows where the intention goes. We are what we repeatedly do. Um, so if you're expecting different things, um, you know, and, you, and you're not practicing it, don't be surprised when you don't get it. So my team struggles to score goals. Well, how much time do you spend practicing scoring goals? Uh, this next slide is, is stolen from Cardiff Blues, who are a rugby team. Um, uh, their week starts with Explore on the right-hand side there. In the middle of the week, um, they try to then evolve towards execute by the end of the week. Um, but that's just whatever fits them and, and their context. But those sessions throughout the week uh, would look and feel really different based on the intention of the session. Uh, Danny Newcomb's piece on, on a practice design continuum 
it's on the screen now for you but uh, yeah it sort of evolves from the bottom left there from lower levels of representation uh, all the way up to the top right um, where there's greater levels of representation and, and more people playing the game the question that I would ask you, and I'd give you a couple of seconds just to think over um, for yourself. Um, if you had, obviously, like 100% of time to give, whenever you're reviewing your practice or a coach or any of the coaches that you support, how much time do we spend in, in these different areas? There's no right or wrong. It's obviously your context specific to you. Loads of things affect this. Um, how many players do you have? What space do you have on the pitch, maybe on, on club nights? Um, do you count the Saturday match as, as part of, of that diet that, that a player gets? Uh, to reference some of the stuff that I'm involved with or have been involved with, with Great Britain Hockey, um, the guys that coach the, the Welsh team, for example, they, they spend quite a lot of time up on the top right-hand corner of, of the screen of that continuum reason being that they're only together for short periods of time they have to prepare for an interna an international fixture tactically they need to be organized and in the right shape so they spend quite a lot of their time in the uh, up in the top right hand side and would drop into the, the small unit and the small sided game stuff just to increase tempo intensity uh, and get as, as many repetitions of things that they need to work on as possible they don't spend any time down at the bottom. They don't feel they have that time. Uh, they rely maybe on a, on clubs and uh, to, to take care of that stuff potentially. That's their professional judgment on their why, their intention, uh, what's their best bang for their buck potentially. However, in, in club land where coaches, you might get to see players Tuesdays and Thursdays and play a game at the weekend. They don't really spend much time up in the, the far top right hand corner of the screen. Uh, at 11 v 11. They spend more time over the middle of the continuum taking chunks out of the game to work on those. There's no right or wrong answer here of course um, but, but where you spend your time. My, my only request would be uh, to, to can ask yourself why really, to can consider why am I doing this, why am I on this point of the continuum for this activity um, and if you can answer that question I think you're on, on the right track anyway to being a good coach. Uh, again, this is quite an interesting slide and I know that we'll, we'll make these slides available uh, via Simon. The second uh, principle is to design the environment to ask the right question. Um, this might be a little bit of bread and butter for most of you, so I apologise for that. Uh, but basically the how, as I would describe it. Where do you put your goals and your boundaries and you know how do you design things and your processes and changes and progressions. So I guess what I'm trying to say, and this is like a really, really interesting point, and I'm going to probably try to describe it uh, in two different ways. Sometimes by offering the opposition a task, it will drive the behavior of what you want. So in hockey, a really simple example might be, if I want my team to pass the ball pretty quickly, I'll say to them like two touch, or you know, you've got three seconds on the ball. Uh, but once the defenders work out that they've got two touches and they've got a couple of seconds on the ball, um, they begin to act accordingly. So the big watch out here would be if you want certain behaviours to happen, um, actually think about the opposite side. Think about what are the opposition doing. So instead of telling the attackers to you know, pass really quickly, what I would do would be to tell the defenders to mark as tight as you can. I will offer you bonus points for being really, really close uh, and, uh, you know, prime them really actually uh what that then makes is your attackers to pass really quickly and i was trying my best to think of a of an individual sport example and i'm probably not going to do this justice at all but i was just thinking if you're trying to work with a boxer with left hand jab instead of telling him to to uh, work on his left hand jab tell the other guy to work on his his left side defense um, which would then open up the other side. So simple instruction to maybe implicitly get the outcome that you work on rather than always explicitly uh, telling players what you want. And there's layers to that and it's counterintuitive, I guess, but there probably is a little bit of common sense in there somewhere. We're very used to saying what's this session about um, and uh, potentially sometimes we should keep that in our back pocket and 
allow the players to, to work it out. And that's the fun bit around practice design, the trade-off conversations, the manipulations and messing around to create the right instabilities. Uh, once we've got the players doing the thing that we have, that we want them to do, then what? Then we coach, you know, that's the job then. The environment is asking the right question. Now I encourage, I reinforce, I question or whatever else. On this stuff, importantly, uh, good players tend to be a good litmus test uh, for whenever they give their feedback. They'll just say, it doesn't feel like it should feel. Good players will start to say things like, I know you want me to go there, but I'm not going to go there because X, Y, Z. A, a good question to ask is, does this look and feel like the game? Is it close enough? Okay, so the next point, uh, re representative design, this is point three out of four. To maximize the potential for learning, consider the impact of representative design. We've covered the theory that underpins it, but uh, ultimately, ultimately it's uh, about zero representation of the game, which is on the left-hand side of your screen at the minute uh, in the red section. And if you flip across to 10, that is being as close to the game as possible. And obviously there's, there's a scale going here and there's a continuum. The amber part would be clunky and you would use it with some sort of form of limitation. For example, I would put the, the bowling machine and cricket in here as an example from earlier. Used with caution doesn't mean don't use. Golfers practicing just on the driving range, is that representative or not? Arguably, it represents part of the game. It is, is it completely representative? No, in my opinion doesn't have slopes, doesn't have usually the wind conditions and different things in, in the environment that would affect your, your decision. And all in golf, for example, we don't just walk up and hit 10 shots within, you know, five minutes or less. Um, actually, it's, it's quite different. So that's quite something interesting to consider about the pace of your session. Does that replicate the pace of uh, your performance? Can we truly ever practice penalties for a semi-final of the World Cup? Um, no, but how close can we get to that? How can we add the right pressure? So whenever you're using a block practice, which is across the, the low numbers here on this screen, it is less like the game. We can't deny that. It doesn't mean don't use though. It just means use with caution. Um, it's like also why you didn't go around to 10 and just stay there and play 11 v 11 all the time. Because if you wanted to get better at shooting, for example, what would the problem be? there might not be enough shooting in 11 v 11. So we take it down, we make it slightly less representative, four or five, but keep the, the bits that we think are important. So dialing up and dialing down in terms of how representative your practice environments are is really important. The problem with them dialed up at 10 all the time is that that's cognitively heavy, physically heavy, emotionally heavy. If you had players for you know, an extended period of time, you can't keep them up there all the time. So you've got to turn it down uh, based on where you are and your context. One of the ways uh, of making sure our environments are more representative is maintaining the goal-directed behaviour. Uh, for example, the goal-directed behaviour for uh, Olympic rowing is uh, go from A to B in the, in the quickest time possible. As a novice, um, that's how I see it. The goal-directed behaviour of invasion games is often scoring in one goal and stopping the opposition from scoring in the other goal. Originally, this research was done on the, the goal-directed behaviour of lions, um, how they governed. They were governed by their, you know, their want to eat, to drink, to reproduce, and, and to repeat. Researchers could begin to predict their behaviours based on where the water was, where the food was, etc. Uh, so, therefore, understand what their their actions might be. Human beings are obviously much more uh, unpredictable, but we as coaches are experienced, so you can start to predict what the player will do based on the goal-directed behaviour. This is the same point from earlier about rewarding the attackers. What did the defenders do? They covered it because that was the goal-directed behaviour, was to stop the other team from winning. So sometimes we can predict what the players will do if we understand the goal-directed behaviour. So to answer the question on the screen, um, a couple of goals in, in team sport would be a good start. You know, to have actually a target, have somewhere to head to. Action fidelity, which again is maybe a little bit waffly, but it, it ultimately just means actions that are faithful to the performance um, environment. How do we do that? You know, we would put in time limits, point scoring, consequences for actions, 
interesting bit of research done around re reward versus punish though is that um that we also need to be mindful of is that if you reward people that the theory would say that it's uh, it's more powerful than than the than the uh, the punishments and, and clearly we need to be really cautious around in sport around punishments and physical punishments and things like that because we want we want our people to enjoy the physical aspect and things like that so something to play about with but used with caution with any emotional load stuff um it would certainly uh, need a bit of time you need to dose it you would you wouldn't want to be training at a high tariff high emotion all the time uh and uh yeah, yeah, basically we need to be mindful of that stuff. So definitely something to play around with, but emotion is uh, a huge part of a, a performance environment. An effective learning design is just related to that emotion. Coaches must design in the appropriate stress and pressure into the environments. Okay. The big takeaway from that last mini section there really is this what the learners are seeing and feeling is similar uh, to, to the game. The final uh, point around uh, the variability and instability, we have covered this already earlier, but uh, you always have to throw in a little bit of chaos, again, with caution and certainly not all the time. Determine the appropriate amount of variability, uh, knowing where your, your group is and what they're, they're trying to, to get better at. So similar continuum once again, Red, too much instabilities. Players can't cope and can't even begin to find any solutions. Would you put your players there ever? Maybe, but with extreme caution. You might be trying to find resilience or leadership aspects or whatever else. With the amber bit, which I'd probably move around to maybe about five, but it's clunky, might cause a change of behavior. Six to zero is, is just practice, probably not hugely unstable. Is it important? Yes, definitely is. The time period just before a game, uh, do you really want unstable, clunky environments? No, probably not. We just want to feel good. Uh, we want to feel we want to feel stable. There's a time and a place to be down at one, two, and three, and a different time and a place to be up in six, seven, and eight. Uh, arguably, I would suggest we probably don't spend enough time um, in the kind of six, seven, and eight amber, messy area. Interesting when players walk off the pitch and they ask, "How was your session?" Um, some say, "Yeah, it was brilliant." Uh, which usually means I was good and my team was successful. You ask somebody else and they say, oh, I find it really, really difficult, my team lost. Um, I wonder which experience might have been better for a learning moment. So balancing that is quite interesting. Uh, this easily applies in individual sports, I think. Uh, and a quick example was a story that I heard about Michael Phelps uh, as, a, as a young participant, maybe 15, and, and the coach um, asking him to go you know, he said, you need to go to the bathroom before you race? He said yes, but he left his goggles behind and the coach uh, stood on the goggles to, to, direct, to deliberately crack them. Um, and by the time Phelps got back to the blocks, race went off, jumped in, water flew up to, in, into his eyes and uh, it was a little unstable moment as such to, to learn from. And I think we need to do that every now and again, just use precaution. Actually, whenever Phillips won one of his major gold medals, the same incident happened again, where he did the whole race uh, sort of blind with, with water in his eyes. So interesting how that's impacted in his learning and, and, and was useful for down the line. A good example of stretch that might still be required in our players is when we ask them to do something on their own, you know, just go away and work on that as an individual. Uh, there's a fairly well-known researcher called Anders Ericsson who's looking into expertise and deliberate practice. He found that learning happens best when there's 50-50 on failure and success. But it's interesting when you ask players to go and work on something, how often do they, they choose something that they actually do fairly well rather than doing something that they struggle with. And I was on a, a webinar the other evening with, with Danny Carey, who's a hockey coach with Great Britain. Uh, interestingly, Ian Sloan, who some people will know, was one of the players, was in that session as well. Ian, now an experienced senior international athlete, um, said it would be more like 70-30 when it comes to this. I want to deliberately disrupt myself. And of course, there's probably a, a, a dose of, of ego within that. And the sense of being seen to fail uh, isn't something that most athletes are are comfortable with. Probably the major takeaway that I took from that session was that 
uh, Danny would say that it isn't going to take away your place in the squad for trying something in training and failing at it. Potentially, what a coach might take you away from the squad for would be for not being able to do something in the match that would have been really desirable. And the reason why you didn't do it in the match was because you hadn't failed enough at it in training, which is really interesting. So just a couple of, of um, little bits of theory. Instability is definitely really, really important in our environments. It's just a, it's an effort to work out how do we do it, how do we plan for it, and how do we change on the fly uh, during the middle of a session. Best coaches can do that, I guess. Um, but importantly, deliberately moving performers into less stable areas is is really important. And to be, you know, to be mindful of of all the different sports, you know, there's different ways we can do things. And something that would be seen as as very closed, uh, again, excuse my ignorance, you know, uh, as a skill, there's definitely ways that we can play about with some of those perceived skill, uh, uh, closed skill sports. Crudely, our job is to design failure. Basically, back to the four points uh, from the very start, really, is these are the, the four principles as I see it. Um, intention, being very, very clear, asking the right question, does the environment design ask the question rather than you having to be explicit? Is it representative? Does it look, does it feel the same? And can you play about with variability and instability? So as I said, so what, now what? Hopefully you had one point that you can go away, dabble with. I'm definitely open to connecting with people off the back of this and having a chat. It's really, really difficult to, to do that in this forum, of course. So thanks so much for uh, listening in. And uh, yeah, fingers crossed uh, there was something that you could take away. So thanks, Simon. I'll, I'll pass back to you.